Chuck Smith attended the uh, Healthy Life Summit too in Orlando. He was he came to us from the uh, YouTube crowd, and like uh, most of the YouTube crowd, he knew his stuff. But he's got a couple of very interesting stories. It started with his family history. He actually has uh, some relatively close ancestors that died in their 30s with heart attack, uh, heart disease. The next part was very interesting and a lot of action. Uh, more action than we usually see on this channel. Uh, Chuck had his heart attack when he was commuting. He was in a Tesla going about 50 miles an hour and um, knew he had some nitro in the back seat. So he put the Tesla on autopilot to get him to the hospital uh, while he's uh, looking around for his uh, nitro. So he'll tell a little bit about that story as well. He's uh, got, he brings some very interesting information to the table about uh, vegan diets. He lost 45 pounds on a vegan diet, uh, cut the oils completely, I um, actually met a couple of uh, the hardcore vegans, uh, Esselstyn, Campbell, that crowd, and cut the oils out completely uh, and, again, lost 45 pounds. So those, those of us who think that uh, you can't make a positive impact on your life with, uh, with a vegan diet, that's not true. He's made a huge impact. Now. Second thing that happened, though, was he noticed, even after that weight loss, that his triglycerides were up and his HDL was down and his blood glucose was up. In fact, his triglyceride uh, over HDL ratio was five. Just as a reminder, one is safe, two is danger of insulin resistance or diabetes, and his was five. He started listening to this channel and learning a little bit more about that specific issue and decided uh, he wanted to come see us at the Healthy Life Summit. I remember meeting him and he told me that experience and said, you know, I'm an engineer. I've already made a lot of positive impacts on my life, but I think I can dial it in a lot more. So uh, we've done a couple of videos on uh, with uh, this interview. We had some technical problems. I wouldn't... Um, the, I wouldn't suggest that you watch this whole thing. You may want to plug it in while you're doing something else and just listen. But here we go. Chuck has an interesting story, and uh, I asked if he would uh, mind sharing it, and he said he would. So, Chuck, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what's happened with you? Sure. Uh, my name is Chuck Smith. I'm from uh, Cocoa, Florida, and... Uh, uh, I definitely got cardiovascular disease, and uh, uh, I guess it starts basically back uh, when I look at my uh, predecessors. My uh, grandfather died of um, heart attack in his 30s. My uncle passed away in his 40s from a heart attack. My dad battled with their cardiovascular disease his entire life, had two open heart surgeries. Uh, first event, I believe, was in his 40s. Second event was in his 60s, and he passed away when he was 70. So I think there was a pretty good chance I was going to have cardiovascular disease. And, um, Pardon so me for interrupting, but, yeah, I, sure. but I will. Um, that gives us a little bit of background on your family. Let's get some background on you. We, we see a couple oh, of hard hats behind you. And uh, what does that say under that hard hat? Got ozone. Oh, yeah, that's my got ozone uh, sticker. Uh, I'm a uh, electrical engineer by trade, and uh, I own a business, an automation business here in uh, uh, Central Florida called Guardian uh, Manufacturing. We've got several companies on Guardian Manufacturing, Guardian Ozone, Pinnacle Ozone, and we do just a whole host of things. Pretty much anything, uh, Dr. Brewer, that a computer controls, we do. So it might be a uh, it might be a breathing dragon at Diagon Alley over at Universal Studios. It might be a uh, uh, might be a launch platform out of the Delta IV pad out at the Kennedy Space Center, or it might be um, it might be an ozone system that actually ozonates uh, municipal drinking water. Uh, the closest one around here is around Sanford, Florida, where we use ozone as an oxidizer to uh, provide a uh, nice, clean source of drinking water to the public. So a little bit of a little bit of diversity there, but uh, I've been doing this now for oh about 28 years or so, and it's, it's a passion of mine and. Uh, 
Um, we're a small company. You know, we've got about 60 folks or so and uh, been doing it now in business for about 28 years. That's an interesting story. And for the uh, for the viewers, I'll just share. Um, Chuck mentioned that he's he's done a lot of high tech work work with some of the rides. Um, we went back. Janice and I had a uh, had an experience on one of the rides where she got pretty sick, uh, and Chuck knew exactly why. There was a little bit of what was it a disconnect between uh, the visual and the and the motion or what? Actually, actually a little little bit of the time delay between the actual motion and the video. And your brain doesn't know quite what to do with it. So, uh, the, the, in, in a lot of people, it, it makes them quite ill. And in Janice's case, uh, uh, she got ill. And, uh, <laughs> and, and fortunately, in that particular ride, uh, we were able to solve that problem just through, uh, you know, going through the timing analysis and, and adjusting that. But yeah, it's 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 pretty interesting. Our uh, our careers have uh, intersected somewhat with the ozone as well. I used to do I set up a lot of clinics for Kroger in terms of the uh, the little clinics for urgent care, and um, obviously I've done some uh, TPS for hospitals. So ozone is a big thing in both uh, grocery and hospital work, right? Oh yeah, the ozone's using just so many different things. From uh, it's used a lot in food safety. It's used a lot in municipal water. Uh, they're using using they're using a lot now in dental dental uh, dental facilities are using it for mouthwashes stuff like that. Uh, although we're not involved in the med medical aspects of it, it's uh, used to actually uh, overnight your blood to help clean up some things in your blood. It's used uh, um, it, it, your your body can accept ozone interestingly uh, um, uh, through through uh, actually drinking it or. Uh, on your body, but what it can't, your lungs can't accept ozone. So ozone is toxic to your lungs. So uh, you have to, it is, it, you have to pay attention to what the ambient ozone levels are for whatever you're doing. But uh, your body can tolerate it quite well. There's actually some, uh, there's actually some olive oils that you can ozonate and use for topical skin treatment. They work fantastic for the uh, you know, uh, different skin conditions. So. Um that's very helpful, Chuck. Now you had mentioned that uh, you've uh, you've got a significant family history of uh, heart attack. Um, you want to get catch us up from there? Yeah. So you know, uh, obviously I knew there was an issue, uh, uh, and not only that, I had another one to the list. Uh, I had a cousin too pass away when he was fifty. I believe he was fifty-seven, fifty-eight. Uh, uh, this is probably about ten years ago, and uh, so there was no doubt. You know, in my mind, I was like, hey, when, when is my event coming, right? So uh, tried to do some planning for that, made some adjustments to diet, started digging into, you know, ways of uh, reducing my statistical risk of having a, a, a cardiovascular event. Um, and, and I thought I was doing fairly well, but uh, obviously that wasn't the case. When I was uh, 54 years old, in December of 2015, I believe it was, I woke up one night, Dr. Burr, and I was uh, just had a real tight, just, just a real weird feeling around my neck. I woke up, couldn't tell what it was. I checked my blood pressure. It was elevated. And uh, I went to the hospital. And uh, they looked at me, checked my component levels. They do all the typical things you do for somebody that might be having a heart attack. and said, hey, you look pretty good. And uh, so I went home. They sent me home the next day. Um, my uh, general practitioner picked up on it. He called me the next day. He said, hey, tell me what happened. And I said, well, I got woke up in the middle of the night. And he's like, well, and he says, I don't like the fact that. He said, I think you need to get a stress test, and I think you need to get one now. So I went and got one, and uh, lo and behold, came back and said, hey, man, you got some blockage, and we'll deal with it. Um, my cardiologist wasn't too concerned about it. He said, hey, um, let's just, it's towards the end of the year. Why don't we just wait till the first part of January, and we'll go in and uh, take a look and see what we need to do. Um, that might not have been such a good idea. Uh, on New Year's Eve, 12, 31, 15, uh, wow. I, was sitting, I was sitting in my office and the entire office starts spinning and just uncontrollably. And uh, fortunately, my brother was in the office with me and he ran me in the emergency room. Long story short, on um, right before uh, uh, probably 8 o'clock in the evening on uh, New Year's Eve, I had two brand new stints put in my LAD. Uh, my LAD was 99% uh, blocked. Um, I did not have a heart attack, so 
the good news is I had no heart damage. So when you get out of that situation, you just feel fantastic. You don't realize that, uh, that you know, how, how you're impaired because of that 99% blockage. So when you get out of the hospital, you feel like a million bucks. And um, so that's sort of uh, where we went there. I did. I obviously made some changes at that point. I, I, went, I went full vegan. I went uh, vegan, uh, low fat, no oil, um, thinking that was the right way to go. Um, going under the pretense that I got my LDL below, let's, I think the number was 70 or so, you know, I would be uh, essentially heart attack proof. So I did that. I got my overall cholesterol down to 120. I think my LDL was 55, um, and then a short two and a half years later, um, I was working out one day and uh, got through working out. It was five o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, went back to my office and I just, man, I did not feel good. I'm like, something's going on here. I said, I think I'm just gonna throw, change clothes, throw my stuff in the bag, and I'm gonna hit the house and see maybe we need to go to the hospital. I don't know. I didn't have any chest pain at that time. Just, just uncomfortable. And uh, so I threw, for some reason, this is such a, a crazy story, but I, I always throw my backpack in the trunk. And I, I, after, some, after I have my stents, I always carry my nitro with me, and I kept it in my backpack. And I had I always throw my backpack in the trunk, and this day I threw it in the back seat. And I was uh, going home. I got every, For every mile I went down the road, I felt, oh, it just got worse and worse. And I finally came to the point and said, you know, I think I'm having a heart attack. And now all of a sudden the, the chest pain is, is coming in pretty strong. And uh, so I, I didn't tell you this piece, but I, I, I've got a Tesla. So I put the Tesla in auto drive. So the car is driving down the road. I'm having a heart attack. I'm reaching around in the back seat, grabbing my, my backpack. I pull the nitro out, pull it out. The nitro tablets go all over the car. But fortunately, when I was laying in the seat, so I pick it up. Pop the nitro. Well, I had never taken nitro before. I would had them in case there was an issue, but never taken one. So as you know, it's a vasodilator, and it definitely did the dilation, and my blood pressure dropped like wham. And uh, so now I'm driving down the road, US-1 in Coco, um, you know, 50 miles an hour, having a heart attack, uh, feel like <clears> I'm about <throat> to pass out. And then at that point, I said, I'm not going to make it home. I'm not going to make it to the hospital, which, by the way, was only like, two to three miles down the road. And uh, so I pulled well, off. That sounds like one of these, you know, you hear that one episode, maybe more now, where the where the uh, the Google driver wrecked and killed somebody. It sounds like it saved somebody, uh, m maybe more than well, one. That, that autopilot helped me that day. I probably should have got off the road a lot sooner. But the interesting thing, I pulled in this parking lot, uh, called 911. You can't believe how hard it is to dial 911 when you're having a heart attack. It's, it's probably the most difficult thing you've ever done, just trying to hit the buttons. I hit speed dial a couple of times. I finally got them, and they came. They, they responded very quickly, laid on the horn, hoping somebody would come help me. Couldn't get anybody to come help me. They were looking at me, but because of the fact that I was laying on the horn, I couldn't get anybody to come help me, but uh, Bard County uh, Fire and Rescue showed up, did a fantastic job of getting me out of the car, uh, in the meantime, while I was waiting on them to come, you know, I really thought I was going to die. I mean, I was uh, that old, you know, they tell you what a heart attack feels like with the elephant standing on your chest. Well, I had a whole herd of them standing on my chest. And I said, this is it. I, I, I was able to get my wife we were just a couple miles down the road where we live. And I had told her goodbye. I said, hey, you know, I'm sorry mm -hmm. I got to do this. This wasn't planned. But, um, you know, I love you. And uh, tell the good kids goodbye. And I thought, literally, at that time, I thought that was it. And, uh, but fortunately, it got me in the, uh, got me in the ambulance, uh, got me uh, down to the hospital. It seemed like it took forever, but I think it only took a couple of minutes. And uh, they had the crew down there waiting on me. When I walked in the door, they started working on me. And then the next thing happened that was really just uh, you know, unbelievable is my cardiologist walks in the door. And I'm like, where did you come from? And he's like, uh, I was just working 24-hour shift. I was driving down the road. I don't know if somebody called him or how he heard about it. But he just came in and totally took control of the situation, got me in, got me in the uh, operating room. And I would say, Dr. Brewer, from the time this happened to the time I had that third stint, right above the first two that they had in my LAD, they sucked the plot out and they put the stint in. I'm going to say it was no more than 40 minutes. Wow. 
And the great news about that is my ejection fracture is still the same as a at the time a 56 year old male. So I didn't have any heart damage, which was no damage. Miraculous. I mean, God took care of me that day for you know, he did a whole a lot of things lined up to go really, really right that it could have gone really, really bad. So that's sort of my adventures, if you will, with cardiovascular disease up until the heart attack. And then after the heart attack, it's sort of been a, a journey, if you will, to come up with an approach that, in my mind, as an engineer, gives me a statistic. You know, statistically, I want to do the best thing I can do with my health so that I know that I'm doing everything I can do based on the data that's out there today to live as long as I can. So that's, that's sort of where I'm at right that's a very interesting story. So just a couple of clarification points and then take the story from there. So one was you were uh, you had three stents total. Mm -hmm. And the uh, your age at, at the time? 56? Uh, 54 for the first two stents. Heart attack a year and a half later at 56. And I'm about to be 58 now. OK. So uh, let's go up to now to the present day. Um, I remember when you and I met that night, you said you, you brought up that engineer piece. You said, um, as an engineer, I don't want this to happen again. You've obviously uh, practiced a little bit of preventive uh, maintenance mm -hmm. and thinking about that for your body, which I wish the uh, medical community would uh, catch up on that concept. Now, um, <clears throat> So you also said, look, I've already done a lot of work and you have. I would like for you, if you would, share what you had done already and then what uh, what you're planning to do next. Right. Well, I sort of went at it from a, a bunch of different uh, directions. Um, a, the first thing is, you know, diet. You know, what are you eating? You know, uh, I had already tried the vegan thing, so I went back and looked at my blood work to say, hey, well, hey, What's going on here, man? My, my LDL was 55. I, you know, I shouldn't be having a heart attack, but I did. Uh, what in my blood work that I have uh, would stand out and say, hey, here's the problem? And uh, that didn't come immediately. That actually came about six months ago when I started watching the PrevMed channel and a couple other ones on YouTube. And they started preaching the importance of the triglyceride HDL ratio. Well, my triglyceride to HDL ratio when I had my heart attack, despite being vegan, and I think this is important, and I got, I, I, I love the vegan approach. I, I love eating it, I love cooking it, but with my issues, um, my, HDL, my triglyceride to HDL ratio was right at five. Oh! Right at five. And so, and, and the interesting thing is here in, you know, my triglycerides were right at 150, right? Which is close to magic. Not sort of the high end, they say, right? Mm. And so my HDL was like 32. So you, you, you work those numbers and you get about five. And uh, so I'm like, that sort of stands out. Um, um, so that, that was sort of the key thing. And the other one is, is blood sugar. And this was interesting, too, because my fasting blood sugar is always just right over 100. Thank Pardon you. the interruption. We've got a little bit of fuzz in there, and if you could repeat that. The other, so the first thing was triglyceride over HDL. Excuse me. Instead of having it at uh, no risk of one or significant, maybe significant risk of two. Yours was at five, despite uh, having lost a good bit of weight uh, mm -hmm. on a vegan diet. The yeah, other definitely. thing that you said, the second thing you said was blood sugar. Yeah, did you so measure my, your blood my, sugar? Yeah, my, I did. I, I, I've been told by a cardiologist a while back, even before my stents, and my blood sugar ah, is a little bit high. It's 102, 103, nothing to be too concerned about. Mention it to your GP next time you're there, and you may want to may want to look further. So, And they did. And, and my A1C um, probably has never been higher than 6. Uh, mm. My fasting blood sugar has never been over 102, 103. Hey, but guess what I found out last weekend? two-hour blood glucose test, you know, you take that 75 grams of glucose and bam, your blood sugar goes to 177 uh, in one hour, you know, and, and then it comes back so, down. So in my so mind, 
now that I know what I know, uh, you know, insulin resistance more than likely is the primary cause of what caused my problem. But but I was in a gray area. I was in a gray area where I wasn't getting picked up by by the, you know the, the traditional medical community. But in reality, I'm, I'm extremely insulin resistant. Extremely what? Insulin resistant. Yeah. So I would agree with you. You're yet one of the uh, another one of those folks that, um, from a, from a society perspective, we're a little bit like that analogy of being slowly boiled by a fro like a frog uh, mm -hmm. and not noticing it. They say that that analogy is not a true thing, but it's it's great for an analogy, and it's clearly what's happening to us as mm -hmm. uh, as a culture. We're we're uh, spending way too much time with blood sugars over 120, and um, our docs are just used to seeing that, and they're used mm -hmm. to to saying something to patients. They don't get a lot of response, and then they just quit saying anything. I think I, uh, I applaud you for recognizing what was going on and focusing on it. I think what was going on with you was, um, yeah, on a, on a vegan diet, you can go vegan low carb. Uh, but usually folks that are on a vegan diet really don't notice carbs at all and don't think about them. And you get a lot of carbs in, uh, in a vegan diet. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, no doubt. And I, you know, I enjoyed the rice, the, the black beans, the, um, potatoes or the corn, you know, all that kind of stuff. And little did I know when I was doing that, I don't know what my blood sugar was spiking at, but I can tell you it was significantly over 150 based on what I've seen now. Yeah, I think it was too. So every time it's over, uh, you know, the higher it is and the more hours you spend at those high levels, mm -hmm. you got two things going on. Number one, you got glucose binding to the protein in your intima. So burning that intima, and you've also got insulin up there. And the insulin is, uh, number one, shutting down your triglyceride burn, and number two, eating up your HDL. So right. changing that triglyceride over HDL ratio. Speaking of which, what is, your, uh, what is that ratio now, Chuck? I'm running about 1.6 right now. I've got a triglyceride level of about 89. 1.6. Yeah, 89. 1.6 from? HDL to 54. Wow, that's excellent. And that's down, the the 1.6 is down from a, a high of five, right? Yes, sir. So About was three, the yeah. five, so was the five during the time that you before you lost your weight? Uh, no, five. Believe it or not, five. I was uh, probably maybe a little bit heavier than I am right now, but not much. It was wow. The, it was a high carb. You're right. I mean, being big, you can lose the weight. I did lose the weight. I dropped my BMI. But How much my, did you lose? Uh, well, yeah, I bought this picture here. Here's a picture of me back about, I don't know, about uh, when I was 42, 43. I'm in the center there. I weighed 215 pounds. So How much do you weigh now? 170. Wow. So, what, 45 pounds? Correct. How tall are you? Five nine. So that's a that's a major major weight loss, and you did that on vegan. Yeah, so I did it on vegan. I, and, and and you know the interesting thing is, like I saw this this morning. It's interesting that after this weekend, you know, Pammy, you know, she she weighs about 110 pounds soaking wet. She loves whole wheat pancakes with some maple syrup, and I've been after her saying, you know, I don't know, you ought to be eating it, you know. And she says, well, let's do what Dr. Brewer said. Let's try to do the blood sugar test uh, on Saturday morning. So this morning, we measured her blood sugar. Her fasting blood sugar was 85. She ate the pancakes, three of them, I might add, um, with a, not a ton of syrup, but a little bit of maple syrup. Her blood sugar peaked probably a little bit over 100. And within two wow. hours, we were back in the 90s. Doesn't and, that make you jealous? Yes, it does. But, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm glad for her, but... The moral of the story is, you know, she can she can probably eat those pancakes for the rest of her life as long as she doesn't get her blood sugar up too high, right? I mean, yeah, it's just I'm I'm obviously not I'm not made that way. I wish I was, but I can't do. If I did that, I don't even know what my blood sugar would be. Too. Yeah, I um, I I can eat a fairly low carb meal and still get a bump up in, over 140, 160. If I eat breads, certainly pancakes, even 
you know, they say, well, whole wheat is very healthy. I mean, it may be very healthy and it may be slower to uh, mm -hmm. to generate that uh, hyperglycemia, right. but it's still, mine goes up 160, 180, and it takes a couple of hours if I don't do something. Yeah, and, and the way I got my the, the numbers down on my triglyceride ratio down was, you know, basically adopting a, a diet that's, a, I would say, low carb. I would say I'm not necessarily doing keto per se. I mean, occasionally I'm sure I dip into ketosis, but I would say on most days I'm consuming somewhere between 50 and maybe 80, 90 grams of carbs. Um, you know, I, I'm doing some intermittent fasting where I don't eat in the morning. Might have a cup of coffee with some MCT by not being oil in it, and uh, not eat till lunch, you know, a small lunch and then uh, dinner. That seems to work for me. I mean, it. Uh, I feel a lot better. I've gained quite a bit of muscle mass as a result of it, and uh, I think that's going to be the. Uh, that's the dieting plan. I'm a. Oh, that's not actually a diet. I mean, it's a lifestyle adjustment. I plan on staying on this for for the for the interim for the for the duration. I guess. You bring up a couple of really good distinctions. Number one, the, the best diet's not a diet. It's a changed lifestyle eating plan. Um, the, the other thing is you bring up some interesting perspective about um, this confusion between, and, and this debate between plant-based and low carb and keto. You know, it's unfortunate. I think a lot of us continue to die because we hear well, keto is good. Plant-based is good. All of these are good. Um, and we really don't focus on what's, what's going on with our body and respond to it. You did a great job in terms of losing 45 pounds on a, on a vegan diet. So I would clearly um, give you kudos and that vegan uh, diet kudos for getting you there. But you didn't stop there you were smart enough to think, okay, you know what? Is there anything else I need to be fine tuning? And then sure enough, you found out that your body was spending hours, probably hours of every day, what probably up 160, 170, 180, because the, um, the carbs in a, people say, well, an OGTT is geared to fail. An OGTT, has 75 grams of glucose. And that's about the amount of uh, sugars you're gonna find in a, um, a large coat, not even a jumbo, and certainly nowhere near a, a big gulp. Um, it's a little, yeah, it's a faster hit to the blood sugar than, uh, than whole wheat pancakes, uh, not a faster hit than uh, whole wheat pancakes with syrup. So we're, uh, that's no more, the OGTT is really no more geared to, um, to uh, make us fail than the diet that we're eating on a regular basis in this country. We had some good discussion about, uh, about that at the event. One of our attendees had actually just come in from a uh, vegan diet cruise. Yeah, that's and he right. Was still yeah. Trying, he was still trying to make his mind up. And uh, I think at the, the end of the day, I, he, this is what he told me. He said, you know what? I think all of your, there's a major overlap with what almost all of you are saying. And that is um, vegan uh, versus uh, something else is, is um, not so, maybe not quite so much the difference. There, there's a major common uh, ground where you're both saying, look, watch for hypoglycemia, stay away from uh, glycemic foods. Now you get the guys that are uh, ketogenic on one end of the spectrum and they just want to eat tons and tons of animal fats. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not that way. I, uh, I agree with you. We tend to stay a little bit ketogenic as long as we're keeping our weight down. Then you get maybe, I think Esselstein and Campbell both would both would say, no, never have any fats or oils, even, oh, um, yeah. even plant-based. And actually, I think you've, uh, you've talked to some folks in that camp. Um, I, I don't think that that's that well supported these days uh, with the new research. I think one of the major things we need to, to make sure, especially as we hit our 50s and 60s, is that our body's not spending hours every day up in the 160s, 180s in terms of glucose. 
Yeah, and I don't think it's a one 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 size shoe fits all either, right? Because right, you know, for me, it just didn't work. For somebody else, that may work just fine. The, the common thread though between them though is the lack of processed foods. All those diets you just mentioned, the lifestyles you mentioned, deal with uh, not consuming processed foods. So you get rid of that. Only real thing we're arguing about really is the consumption of animal animal protein for the most part, because I still eat a lot of vegetables. I eat tons of broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and um, some nuts and seeds and things like that. So I, I still do quite a bit of plant based, but it is along with some healthy fats and along with a little bit of protein and uh, probably a good bit of salmon. Yeah. Uh, actually, again, I think these diets are a lot closer. Uh, for those of us, and, and uh, unfortunately, it's in the majority once you get into the 60s, those of us who do have developed some insulin resistance. I think that's the opportunity that we have as a culture and a society, and that is to recognize how many of us are getting uh, insulin resistant as we get older. We're just not recognizing it. Like you said, your wife uh, is not going to have any problems, at least right now and until uh, maybe she adds a few more years with uh, carbs. She did and fine you, with it. You said something interesting this past weekend about, you know, which came first, the insulin resistance or the weight gain. And I'm of the opinion that the insulin resistance, you, you develop this insulin resistance, and then the weight gain is what followed. I mean, that, that, that sort of makes sense to me. And I think in my case, that's what happened. But uh, when I just look back, and then when I look back at, too, my dad, same kind of thing. Uh, you know, he matched up the exact same way. You got you got my message. That was uh, that was exactly the point. And actually, I didn't come up with that. I uh, I got that reading Gary Taubes. You know why we get fat and what to do about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. um, and several other authors have said the same thing. They say, you know what? We expect people to get a middle age spread. That's why they call it the middle age spread. Um, we just get heavier and we also expect them to get insulin resistance. At least the docs do, but as we've discussed, don't really focus too much on it. Well, <clears throat> why, do you, why do you get that middle age spread? Is it simply because your, um, your gender related hormones aren't, aren't cooking along, your basal metabolic rate is not going as fast? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think we, as we start getting insulin resistant, our blood sugar starts doing this. And then as our blood sugar starts doing this, you, you're up here at 160, you dip down to 80 and you get, uh, you get some hunger reaction to that. Yeah. And you start cooking along with a high basal insulin and um, it's just easier to eat, makes you hungry. Well, that, that's the, I guess the other thing you asked me about was, you know, what other things am I doing? I am yep. doing some other stuff besides the lifestyle adjustment in terms of eating. Um, exercise is a big part, right? We talk about that. Um, uh, what I do right now, I walk. I try to walk. I don't do it every day, but I get about five times a week, two mile walk at a brisk pace, about a 14 to 15 minute mile. Um, that helps. I've uh, been doing that for a while now. Um, I do resistance weight training. Uh, I found this uh, one I really like, it's called X3, X3 bar. And uh, it's a quick 15, 10 to 15 minute workout that concentrates on just resistance weight training, these big rubber bands. That works well. And then what I've done recently within the last three months is I've incorporated uh, a 20 minute hit workout that you recommended. Uh, I've got one of these Peloton bikes and they've got a hit program on there. And uh, that is really, uh, that has really helped me uh, on my glucose level. Uh, like you say, I try. I do it every other day. I don't have to do it every day. You know, every 48 hours, I try to get it in. I know I'm not perfect with it, but I'm, it's working out pretty good. So you, I'm glad you mentioned that because say that again. That and let me clarify. So the research, uh, the medical science would indicate that. If somebody does uh, resistance training or high intensity interval training, especially with the large muscles in the leg, hips and back, it's almost like a long acting insulin. It tends to drop your blood sugar and it tends to make your body, your muscles more reactive to insulin, less resistant to insulin. 
Yep. So I hit, I tend to see that as well. If I drop my hit training, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult for me to handle the same meal that I had when I'm, when I'm doing it. So what, could you repeat what you, what you were saying? You said it's, you manage your glucose a lot better when you're doing that. Yeah, I do. And, and I just found with that 20 minute hit ride, um, my glucose levels seem to be more stabilized. Uh, maybe the baseline's a little bit lower. Uh, I feel better for sure. Uh, I definitely developed some uh, uh, better lower le lower body strength, um, and that and, and, it, and it doesn't have like you said it doesn't have to be done every day. So it's not like it's arduous. It's it's 20 minutes. Now it is 20 minutes as you say of it's tough. I mean you're you're getting to the point where you can't talk, or you're breathing, yeah. your heart. And I do wear a heart rate monitor. I've got a nice one that wears on, it goes on my uh, forearm. And I'll get my heart rate up to, I don't like it to go over 130, 135, but it gets up in the 120s and stays there for a good solid 10 to 12 minutes. And, uh, you know, when you're done, you're, you know, you got a good sweat worked up. And, and uh, you know, I think it works. And it's yeah, not that hard. For me, it dro it drops my uh, basal uh, glucose rate, but it also, more than that, it really tends to cut the top off of the uh, postprandial, the stuff after the peaks after the eating. They right. they go up a lot less and they come back down a lot quicker. Right. Chuck, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about. <clears throat> uh, in the event you shared with folks that you have a glucometer, an an o um, CGM, continuous uh, glu uh, glucose mi meter. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that with the viewers? Yeah, at, you know, at, you know, after listening to you talk about insulin resistance and um, how important it was, and watching that level, that 120, right, not letting that blood sugar go over 120, I started doing finger pricks. Well, a, I got tired of pricking, pricking my finger. I mean, I was doing it probably too much more than I should, but. I uh, just got tired of it. I, I saw a commercial, a Dexcom commercial, D-E-X-C-O-M, and, uh, and I bought one. I went to my general practitioner and said, hey, I want to do one of these. He said, well, you don't have diabetes. I said, yeah, but humor me. Let me buy one. I'm not going to hurt anybody with it. And uh, he says, here's a prescription. You know, knock yourself out. And that has been really instrumental in terms of uh, experimenting with different kinds of foods to see how that impacts me directly and to keep that blood glucose level below 120. And I've got it dialed in now, Dr. Brewer. I mean, I know exactly what I can eat. I know what I can't eat. And uh, and, I'll, and I know I'll pay the price. An, an example, I uh, I eat at a, a Thai restaurant once a week, and I like getting sashimi, and I get salmon sashimi. And it comes with a combo. It comes with two small pieces of sushi, probably less than a quarter cup of rice. Um, and... I would eat those two pieces of sushi, and bam! And I'll let, I can only back up. If I didn't eat those two, if I just ate the fish and a small side salad, you know, my blood sugar might go to one one fifteen, one eighteen, something like that. Not over one twenty. It's a small bump. But if I eat those two small pieces of sushi, uh, it's gone. It's it's one forty plus. So I've learned. I really so sense the difference. That. There is the rice. It's the rice. It's, it's yeah. the rice. And, and there's also, there's a two piece of sushi and there's a small thing of white rice, of which I'll only eat about maybe, a, I think I maybe eat a quarter of it. So not, not a yeah. lot at all. I mean, maybe a quarter cup, maybe a little bit over a quarter cup of white rice if you add it all up. And I just, I just can't do it. So now that I know I can't do that, I don't do that. And just those little bit of tweaks, as we talked about last weekend, you know, I'm looking to where, where can I tweak to do stuff? And I think, you know, somebody who is insulin tolerant, do you need to wear one all the time? Probably not, but would it would it benefit you to wear one for a couple of weeks to see what you're eating is impacting your health and how where your blood sugar is going? Because the problem is when you do the finger stick, right? You don't know if you're grabbing the peak, right? You right. Could be on either you side, of your peak could be thirty percent higher than what you're measuring, and you'll never know it. So I think that the blood glucose monitor, even though you you can argue about the calibration of it, it uh, it helps answer that. It's better than not having. That's very true. You um, you're you're the first person that I've met that's already been doing uh, CGM with Dexcom, and you mentioned uh, calibration. One of the major uh, 
focus points and frustration points. People expect every reading of every lab to be exactly correct. We had a lot of discussion about that this weekend where I will classically see a fasting glucose that's drawn uh, and the same, same, um, same sample of blood is also used in a fasting glucose for an OGTT and it's routinely 10 off. And that is at the reference lab. People get very frustrated with the Libre because they say, oh, it's at least 10 off all the time and I don't know what to do with it. Had a lot of discussion about that. With a Dexcom, you don't have quite that much uh, issue. There's, a, there's an option for calibration. Can you mention how you do that? Yeah, the, the, it does have a calibration feature where you can take a, a finger prick, read the number, pull up the calibrate mode on your phone and just enter in whatever your, uh, your blood glucose meter tells you and that recalibrates it. I found I need to recalibrate it at least once, once a day is what I'm doing right now. And you probably go once every two days, but it does require, you know, you want that, if you really want the accuracy, you're going to have to calibrate more. If you, if you did not, you probably go a couple, two, three days. So if, for somebody like me, does it matter that much? Probably not. I'm just looking at trends. But uh, it is an issue. And, and I think that's one positive of Dex, Dexcom is you can calibrate for the others you don't. But uh, you still do need to calibrate. Yeah. And of course, the negative on the Dexcom is that it's so much more expensive. Yeah, so it's a bit more pricey. Now, but at the end of the day, ex it's exactly what you're saying. And it's exactly what one of the... Um, the the attendees at the conference said she said i haven't i haven't found that video yet but she said there's a youtube video where someone has a libre patch on this arm a libre patch on this arm mm -hmm. and uh throughout the day keeps going through the patch every time they're at least 10 off this one's always 10 higher than this one yeah. but uh he wakes up in the morning and sure enough he had a he had a low point at three, four, five in the morning. It starts coming up. He eats something for breakfast. It goes up. They both go up, and so they're just doing this lockstep all day. The other thing that what that does is, as you said, and as Jenny Rule said, you are able to eat to the glucose. You know what's going to cause problems and changes in your blood sugar. So you're now in a much better mode of control than you ever were. Yeah, correct. Correct. Thank you so much for sharing this, uh, Chuck. Do you have anything else uh, you wanted to share with the viewers? Yeah, I think the only, the, 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 I guess, two, two, uh, two other thoughts. One other thing is stress reduction. That was the last component of what I wanted to, to address. And that's the last thing I, I've really struggled with is how to get rid of stress. We chatted about it a little bit. Um, I always sort of thought meditation was sort of far out there. But I will tell you this. I uh, started meditating about a month ago and just two 15-minute sessions a day. And uh, I'm using a program called uh, Ziva Meditation. And I'm sure there's 10 other ones. But I'm telling you, I... I've experienced some fairly significant uh, improvements in my overall health and the fact that I get, I sleep much better and I have much more focus. So getting in, and, you know, I run a company, so I've got 50, I got 50 some odd employees that we deal with and it's stressful and there's nothing you can do to get out of that stress. And you don't have to actually even know that you're under stress, but you are under stress. And, and that's one thing you've got to address with, if you got cardiovascular, you got to get that stress out. You either got to back off the work, or you got to come up with a way to get it out of your body. I haven't perfected that yet, but I'm I'm trying. So if I could again, because it was a little bit uh, fuzzy for a second there, um, it sounded like you said medicating for stress, but you said <laughs> meditating. No, no meditation, for... meditation. And it sounded, you thought it sounded a little bit out there, but then you started doing it. You got a, a what, a, uh, an app and started. I bought, I bought a course. It's called Ziva, Z-I-V-A uh, Meditation. Okay. Emily Fletcher has started it. And uh, I picked it up on Dave Asprey's uh, podcast and I, and I bought it. It's a, it's a ball package and, uh, and, and I tried it. And, uh, and I got to tell you, Dr. Burry, it worked. It worked for me. Yeah, it worked for everybody. It's really worked for me. It does. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And then uh, I guess the only last thing, you know, as you said at the, at the meeting, you know, the, 
there's no doubt I'm predisposed to genetically to, to have these kind of issues, but you know, the genetics loads the gun and you pull the trigger. And I've already pulled the trigger once and I don't really want to pull it twice. <laughs> and, uh, and, and and then I have folks tell me, you know, hey man, why are you doing this? Uh, you know, you got the genetics; it is what it is. Just do what you do. And I think there's more to it than that. As you say, it's just not that simple. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, you could go two very different directions at this point in your life, Chuck, and you know it. And it's uh, it's frustrating to see the folks that that don't agree and just think, you know what, I got to keep. Uh, uh, BMI up over 30 because that's just the way life is and I'm not going to change the way I eat. It's not worth it. Uh, I can't be happy unless I can eat what I'm eating now. Right. And um, that, that is not true. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Brewer, for all you do, man. You've made a huge impact in my life. Uh, you as well as the other staff there at Fred and Ed. I can't thank you enough. Uh, just all the information you put out there has, has made an impact in my life, and I'm sure it's made an impact in many others. So just please keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate that, Chuck, and uh, by far the major impact has been what you've done. I appreciate you uh, doing what you've done. That's a, a legacy thing for me. Anything else for the for the viewers? I, I guess the only thing else, maybe you know, if you've got cardiovascular disease or you're or you've had a history or your family has a history of cardiovascular disease and you're you're concerned or worried or you know whatever may be the case uh do something about it there's a, there's a lot of information out there on the web and there, there's plenty of books and stuff uh you know, dr brewer's youtube channel is a fantastic place to start and uh and, and make an impact because you can change the outcome of this. if i had to do it all over again i'm convinced i could uh, keep it from happening I am too. Thank you for that message. And thank you for the time uh, that, and the experiences you've shared, Chuck. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Burr. It was at this point that Chuck and I realized we forgot to talk about his uh, CIMT. He was in an interesting category there as well. He didn't show plaque. Uh, and his arterial age was uh, younger than his uh, biological age. Now that's unusual. There are a couple of possibilities there. One is, uh, and the one that Chuck thought about was maybe he had reversed it all. It is possible to reverse plaque. Uh, as you know, I've done that uh, on, with myself. Usually if you're gonna reverse plaque, it tends to be though fairly young plaque. And that's unusual when you do. Another possibility with Chuck was that he, um, he was one of these unusual people that maybe had a little bit of plaque in uh, coronary arteries, but didn't have it in carotids. Now that's a possibility, but again, that's far less than 5%. I tend to lean towards the latter because he, he shared with me that uh, the docs told him they couldn't really find uh, plaque anywhere else except this one area of his, uh, his Widowmaker, his, uh, LED. But we'll talk about that in, uh, in the rest of this video. So one thing we uh, we didn't talk about was your CIMT, Chuck. You want to tell us a little bit about what you saw there? Oh yeah, what what an experience that was. That was one of the one of the reasons for going to this uh, conference last week in Orlando was to see CIMT. And uh, I'd be honest with you, Dr. Burr, I was I was apprehensive about taking it because I didn't want to ask the question that I didn't want to hear the answer. And uh, uh, I, you know, we took the test on a Friday night and then it, uh, we got the results on Sunday morning. And I got to be honest with you, I, I didn't sleep very good Saturday night. And uh, on Sunday morning, David was passing out the results like the professor in college, you know, passing out your quiz back. And I'm like, this is either going to be a really bad day or it's going to be a good day. And I got the results and I, and I, I looked at it and couldn't believe what I saw under plaque burden, which is sort of the ones that, that's where everybody goes to, said none, none, N-O-N-E, none. What was your arterial age? My arterial age was uh, two years younger than my chronolog chronological age. And uh, needless to say, it, it was uh, it was an emotional event. I mean, it was like this, this journey that I've been on for, geez, going on three years now. 
at least was going in a positive direction rather than going downhill. And uh, so it was, it was, it was pretty cool. And, and at the same time, you know, there was a lot of guys there that, that didn't get good results, right? So my heart sort of went out to them, but you know, but at the same time, trying to encourage them to say, "Hey, guys, look, you haven't had an event yet. So this is yeah. this is a blessing. You know, you got, you know, it. Maybe it's not the best news you wanted, but guess what? You learned a whole lot this weekend in terms of how to go take that the other way." That was funny. I was uh, I was having a very different experience as uh, I shared with you. Usually I'll tell crowds, don't go there in terms of the mean max, the total plaque burden, uh, all of that stuff, that first section on, a, on the CIMT because it's so confusing and sometimes so scary. Uh, the YouTubers there knew so much about what was going on. I decided to take the risk and was sweating and stammering through all that. Uh, meanwhile, as you mentioned, it was not just emotional for you. These, uh, there were what two dozen people uh, there who were getting their their results back. Janice mentioned to me. She said, "Yeah, I'm." I'm she said, "That's why I said, uh, please uh, ask Chuck what's going on." Because she said she looked over there and she looked like she said you looked like Snoopy doing the happy dance. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> put balance in my leg. I was so happy. It was awesome. It was an incredible experience. It really was. But, uh, you know, and then I asked you the question, you know, hey, I've had cardiovascular virtues before and I do a CIMT and it says I have no plaque. What's the probability that I possibly reverse this? And then uh, you, know, you came back and said, I might bet on that. Yeah. So I, I think, again, I think you're in, uh, in really good shape given what, what I see on your CIMT. I think you've done some very, very good work. I appreciate you sharing that with uh, with the viewers. You bet. You bet. Talk to you later. Thanks. And if you hit that uh, subscribe or like button, it makes a big difference. Um, an even bigger difference happens when you share. You can share on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Pinterest. When you do that, it makes a big difference in terms of the algorithm. It sends... Um, this to other people realizing that humans think this is interesting information and helpful. Um, thank you again.